It's expected that the minions and mudslingers in the corridors of power will pick a fight because they will misconstrue this as an attack on their paymasters. Some may come against me with threats because they will see this address as an onslaught on the enterprises that they have built at the expense of the Nigerian people. My preemptive response to this attack dog is simple. Bring it on. Pastor Tunde Bakari. Don't let me to know is not joking. The DSS has taken action right now. This is not a joke. While Bola Metunubu is struggling, trying to cover up his tracks, I'm talking about the past. Forgery, Chicago University, is he going to stop being president? What about the past regime president, Major General Muhammad Buhari retired? What about him that was presented a certificate that he never wrote, that his principal wrote to him, a letter to present to the Nigerian army back then for him to be admitted in. A letter saying that he's qualified to write an exam that he never wrote or passed. He is asking questions. But whilst this is ongoing, and you know, Bola Metunubu is angry at this time. He will not expect or want the tribunal to come up with a verdict that will bring in either Tiku Abubaka or Peter Opi. Now, there is a man called... Tunde Bakari is a pastor. He used to be vice president, aspirant, or candidate to the past government. I'm talking of uh, Major General Muhammad Buhari. But both of them could not, uh, you know, work together. I mean, they were not powerhouses. It didn't just work out at that time. Well, it seems uh, Pastor Tunde Bakari decided to finish Bola Metunubu as regards some, you know, international issue, I mean border issue, like Niger issue, and other issue. Don't forget that he wanted to be president. He said after the after the government of Buhari is the next person. God said it. By God this and that. I'm not saying you should not you should not have faith. But politics is what politics is. Anyway, he has started talking and it seems this talk will land him in problem. Bola Metinumi is an angry man right now. He's fighting to survive. He's fighting to remain. He's fighting to stay in. He doesn't want certain things to be revealed out. He has, um, you know, tried several ways, written to um, the United States government, written to the, you know, um, Senate. He has done a lot. He has written to the committee of the board of the Chicago University, um, telling them that none of his educational qualification or private um, information should be released um, to the public, neither to the tribunal or wherever, that there is a kind of, um, you know, you know, he came up with this, you know, law um, of 1970, something that protects his uh, private data and this and that. And they are asking him to give them reasons more why his data as president of Nigeria should not be released for further investigation. So whilst he's you know, kind of um, trying to survive all of these um, stones being thrown at him, you know, shadows of the past, a man is now speaking, saying things to him. Things that he is not ready to listen to. Things about how he should undo um, Echoas, how he should undo Nije, how he should undo that and all of that. And he's like, like seriously? He's like, this man, you want to go to jail. From the look of things, if Pastor Tunde Bakari is not careful, uh, Bola Metunubu is not a man that can, you know, at times, if he gets upset and angry, he could use some backdoor way of dealing with Pastor Tunde Bakari. Some of you might say, no, it is not true. Well, let us hear what Pastor Tunde Bakari said. So we can now confirm if this could result into some backlash, like a man angry, ready to attack anybody that is attacking his government, attacking his personality. Let us hear Pastor Tunde Bakari. I would like to begin this address by identifying with my fellow Nigerian citizens who are often unceremoniously described as ordinary Nigerians or average Nigerian. I salute the Nigerian citizen who has for so long a time borne the brunt of the capricious policies of political actors and the greed of a colluding elite from a wrongly implemented Naira redesign policy 
to an impulsive fuel subsidy removal announcement and from a drowning of purchasing power in an attempt to flood the Naira to an unbearable increase in the cost of basic amenities. The past and recent months have been particularly excruciating for the Nigerian citizen. I'm talking about employees who have been forced to trek owing to the unaffordable spike in transportation costs. Parents struggling to bridge the gap between their life savings and the cost of living. Graduates whose chances of getting a job have become slimmer due to the impact of the economy on the labor market. I'm talking about that trader whose meager daily income has further diminished in value due to the dwindling value of the Naira. That farmer who looks on in agony as his produce rots on the farm due to transportation challenges, inflation and insecurity. Those children who will invariably be sent home in September due to outstanding fees. I acknowledge you fellow citizens of our nation because you are the true heroes. The rulers that are, they are immune to the pain that you have to go through daily and they are not true reformers. You, the Nigerian citizens, who have borne the burden of an ill-planned and vaguely-led reform agenda, are the true reformers. You are the true reformers because of your adaptability. You are the true reformers because of the creative ways by which you are just to hardship. You reform your personal and corporate economies yeah, that's and navigate the increasingly attention. difficult terrain. All the words you, the so-called ordinary today. Nigerians, are the true reformers because somehow, hoping against hope, you show up every single day in what will appear to be a federal republic of diminishing returns. Therefore, my fellow Nigerian citizens, I may bold to say that there's nothing average about you. There's nothing ordinary about you. There's indeed nothing common about you. You are distinguished citizens of our nation and you deserve the best of the land. The purpose of government is not to serve cronies. It's not to pander to corrupt business interests. It's not to patronize a consumptive political class. It's not even to appease neo-colonial foreign powers. The purpose of government is to serve you, the Nigerian citizen. Therefore, the focus of this address is just simply how to ensure that the government serves you. Let me say up front that I'm not unmindful that this address will be taken out of context by political propagandists within and outside of government. I'm not unaware that my motivations will be questioned and my intentions maligned. It's expected that the minions and mudslingers in the corridors of power will pick a fight because they will misconstrue this as an attack on their paymasters. Some may come against me with threats because they will see this address as an onslaught on the enterprises that they have built at the expense of the Nigerian people. My preemptive response to this attack dot is simple. Bring it on. Exactly, exactly. Tell them. When in his them. inauguration address on May 29, 2023, President Tinumbu announced that sub fuel subsidy is gone despite the cautious exclusion of that contentious speech by his advisors. It was clear that our nation had been unwittingly plunged into chaos by a very poor change management process. Whatever the president's true motivations were, it is clear that he put the car before the horse. What's also clear is that the president was economical with the truth by giving Nigerians the impression that was taking a courageous move or step to remove the first subsidy when the previous government had already taken that step. 
without economic justice, the attempts to sanitize the sector, including the Petroleum Industry Act, the abrupt subsidy removal, the exchange rate harmonization policy, and the announcement of pallia palliatives will all amount to papering over the cracks of a broken down wall while the foundation is fast caving in. I have a question to ask all our agencies. Are they crime fighters or crime facilitators? Or how have these sudden transactions taking place over a decade under the watchful wow, wow. eyes of the Economic wow. Financial this Crimes Commission? Serious. How did these underhand dealings, which are clear threat to our national security, continue for over a decade right under the nose of the State Security Service or the Department of State Service, as they are now called? Why have these alarming reports come from bro probes carried out by legislature, the legislature and civil society organization alone and not from the security and law enforcement agencies? Why did the DSS work with vested interests just to discredit the probe of the House Committee in 2012 rather than investigate the individuals and organizations indicted and prosecute those found culpable as recommended by the committee? Recently, the actions of the DSS have raised concerns about professionalism and adherence to the rule of law. Instances such as the reported invasion of the premises of the EFCC and the handling of the case of the suspended governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, Mr. Godwin Emefiele, has sparked discussions regarding the need for due process and equitable application of justice. Considering the reported claims by the DSS that his actions were in line with an order from above, the handling of the Emefiele case has sent a signal to the world that the current president's disposition to the war against corruption is primarily motivated by a clampdown on perceived political I'm adversaries sure while various other see. enemies of Nigeria remain untouched. <laughs> Mr. Godwin Emefiele may have made the wrong judgment calls in the management of Nigeria's monetary policy, but it must not be made a scapegoat by the provisions of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN Act 2007, there's every possibility that the HY Central Bank governor did not act without presidential authorization. <laughs> if MFLA is found liable for any crime, by all means, it should be prosecuted. However, considering the dynamics of the pre-election environment, and the then candidate Bola Tinumbu's public allegation that the Naira redesign policy was targeted at him, the optic of the president targeting a mafia left for prosecution after winning the election and being sworn in as president could be interpreted as a form of vendetta far beneath such a distinguished office. The same can be said of the detention of the suspended chairman of the EFCC, Mr. Abdurashid Bawa, Mr. Bauer was not only linked to the Naira redesign policy, he had also disclosed that the anti-graft agency will arrest and prosecute some outgoing governors after the expiration of their immunity on May 29, 2023. Today, Bawa is being held in detention by the DSS while Belo Matawale a former governor that Bauer had been investigating has been nominated by the president as a minister. Welcome back, welcome back. I do not know what your thoughts are as regards this one. You heard what Pastor Tunde Bakari said. And um, of course, you, there could be some kind of um, form of common sense. A lot of Africans have said the move of ECOWAS or the Nigerian government um, towards Niger is not acceptable, that that should not happen. And I'm kind of thinking, unless something else happens, unless something else happens, I do not think that uh, the president will move into Niger. The Senate has already said, no, we are not giving weapons, we are not permitting this. Please let us mind the issues that we have in Nigeria. We have internal crisis that has not been resolved, that has become business. Business that, uh, you know, that international bodies 
I'm talking of countries have hands inside. So let us deal with this cancer that we have rather than we putting our hands into another Niger problem, which will not just be the Nigerian army going there to fight and all of that. It will also be a, a kind of um, broken down system where their own terrorist militants will begin to move into Nigeria where they can begin to do business again. Since um, Niger is no longer a country where they can um, do whatever it is that they do, you know, commit the atrocities that they commit. So people are looking into this also now. Pastor Tony Bakari, like many of this, you know, very wise people, um, like Obasan, you're very wise people. They talk. They know how to write episodes. They know how to write articles. They know how to talk and call newsmen when election is not this. But when it is their own turn, when they are in power, all of a sudden, they just lose the ability to think well. If Pastor Tony Bakari is given the opportunity to be president of Nigeria, if he becomes president of Nigeria, you'll be surprised that Pastor Tunde Bakari will not be able to perform. You'll be surprised that Pastor Tunde Bakari will not be able to execute nothing. It will still be the same kind of, you know, rough, 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 rough here and there. I don't know why. When they get there, they can't do and perform. Are they lying to us? Or do you think that we need new hands, people with intellectual, you know, and, you know, all of that to drive Nigeria to the right direction? But like I've always said, most of the time, it's not about education. Education is important. But it's about the system. We need to, I mean, do away with the system that we have. Come up with a system that is strong. Strong to a point whereby if you bring a rubbish, in, you know, uh, you bring someone that is not an illiterate in as president of Nigeria, it will just be a caretaker. There will be a limit to what he can do. He will not be able to upturn the system, break the system, twist the system, crash the system. But the kind of presidency we run in Nigeria is, is it's a crazy one. Where the president is the alpha, is the omega, is the beginning, is the end. The president can turn the whole of the country upside down within seconds. It doesn't work in countries where things work, you know, where things are, where a lot of people look up to. It doesn't work that way there. Why? It is not about their president. It's about the structure and the system that is so strong that has been put in place. And of course, the culture of Sai Baba, they don't have it. You call your own president, uh, whatever, you know, you call your president what you call your president. You call your president uh, father or daddy. And these are the kind of cultures and traditions that are so useless. What are your thoughts as regards this one? Like and share this video, subscribe to this channel. See you in the next update.